this is going to be a wonderful journey through Isaiah 40. And we're going to study one of the most powerful parts of Isaiah, the theology, God's uh, attributes. So let's pray. Dear Father, I pray that we would, we would experience the power of your character, uh, that we would understand what you've revealed about who you are and how that can change the way we live uh, every day of our lives, if we'll let you. In Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah 40 <clears throat> is packaged by Isaiah 26.3. We're supposed to be in perfect peace. Uh, perfect, shalom, shalom, means a complete, a life that's complete. It's peaceful, it's at rest, while our world is not. And where we've come is to our 10th class. Theology usually is thought of as boring. But theology, theologia, is the, the study of God. And the best way to study God is through the names of God, and we call that the character of our awesome God. And God has given us these names, these attributes, and they are awesome. So let's begin in Isaiah 40, and I just want to read. Do you remember yesterday, we started on verse 8, uh, that uh, actually 6 through 8, 6 says, all flesh is grass, and the grass withers, verse 7, the flower fades. And then it repeats that, the grass withers in verse 8, the flower fades, but the word of our God. So that was inspiration. So what does the inspired word of God teach us about God? Well, starting in verse 12, who has measured the water in the hollow of his hand? Who has measured heaven with a span? Now, in the Bible times, they called this a span uh, from your thumb to your little finger, and they called this a cubit. That's how they measured things. They'd say, how big is the pulpit? And you'd go, oh, it's a cubit and almost a span. And so what it's saying is God is so great, he can, from outside the universe, go like this and measure the whole universe. Verse 12, who has calculated the dust of the earth in a measure? Verse 12 continues, weighed the mountains. Already we're talking about a whole new level, uh, and I could add, you know, uh, omnipotence and, and all the other uh, different attributes of God. Um, on and on it goes. Verse 15, the nations are a drop in the bucket, and on and on. So that's the character of God. Now look, I love this picture. Look at those eyes. That's a child that's not sure about something. Maybe it's riding a bicycle, maybe it's jumping into the pond, I don't know, the rope swing. Uh, but their mouth is open, they're, they're wide-eyed, either they're happy, they're sad, they're scared, or whatever. God wants us today to put his strong arms around all of our fears. Remember, we're supposed to fear not, fear not, fear not. So how do we fear not? Well, in this today, we're going to survey the majesty of God, starting in Isaiah 40, in these two verses that, that I was reading to you, 10 and 11. Starting with 10, Behold, the Lord shall come with a strong hand. His arm shall rule for him. His reward is with him. His work is before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm. Carry them in his bosom. Do you, do you see John 10? Do you remember Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd and I'm the one that takes care of my sheep and the good shepherd gives his life for sheep? That's how God, he says, I'm so eternal, unchangeable, wise, omniscient, omnipotent, all that, but I want you to understand me and I'm like a shepherd. So this, this is how I marked my Bible. Look how chapter 40 starts. Now I know it's a little blurry, but look at verse 3. What is verse 3? Who does that remind you of? Where does that show up in the New Testament? Yeah, that's John the Baptist. Do you remember the structure? Uh, okay, everybody, look up. We're doing another part of our quiz. How many chapters are in Isaiah? 66. How many cha uh, books are in the Old Testament? And so what book of the Bible would Matthew be? Number what? Number 40. What chapter are we on? 
Where is John the Baptist introduced in the New Testament? In the 40th book. Just, do you see how Isaiah parallels the structure of the whole Bible? The 40th book is parallel with the beginning of the New Testament. There are 39. Now remember, Isaiah, the outline of Isaiah has two parts. God chastening his people, God comforting his people. The second part is starting right here. Comfort. And, and look what it says. Speak, verse 2, comfort to Jerusalem in your Bibles. The voice of the Lord, verse 3, make way, the, the, the pathway for the Lord. So the whole book of Isaiah is structured around this chastening for their sin and comfort and a future. Now, I just wrote into my Bible, I, I like to collect the attributes of God. There are 20-some attributes of God. So here is one attribute, the glory of God. So I wrote in the margin there, glory. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. All flesh shall see it together. Glory. The word glory in the Old Testament, so that's one of God's attributes, his glory, is the word kevoth. Kevoth. Do you know what it means? All of you have seen this word in action. Do you remember Eli who had two bad sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and they took the ark out like a charm to fight the Philistines, and the Philistines captured the ark? What was Eli doing? Eli was sitting on a bench waiting for them to bring the ark back to the tent of the tabernacle, and when the news came that his sons lost the ark and got killed by the Philistines, what does the Bible say happened to him? He fell over off the bench broke his neck and died. You, what a terrible thing to start your morning with. Do you know what the very next line in 1 Samuel is? For he was old and heavy. What does that mean? He was heavy. He was big. Heavy. That's what the word glory means. Kavoth means heavy. It doesn't mean God is overweight. It means that God's glory pushes on things. There's a, there's a heaviness. There's a weight. That's a better way to put it, weight. Now, the more you want to glorify God, the more you feel with every part of your body the weight of the glory of God. That you, you, you think about your words are being spoken in front of God. Your thoughts are actually, he's watching our thoughts like you are watching these screens. God is seeing what we're thinking, hearing what we're saying, and his glory, his heaviness, his, his impact on us is, I want to glorify you. If I'm going to think something, say something, do something, I want you to be reflected by it. So, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. All flesh shall see it together. Now, theologically, this attribute of God speaks of the way he shines with this bright light. And that usually makes people back up because God is, is dwelling in unapproachable, this glorious power, and you can't even look on it. Uh, Moses, remember, went up in the mountain and scared all the people. Now, over there in verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. That's his eternality. The, the eternity of God is so tied to his omnipresence. Omnipresence mean this, it means this. God is everywhere equally present in every part of the universe, but he operates differently wherever he is. Did you catch that? We don't even understand what that means. It isn't, God is not in everything. That's panentheism. God isn't everything. That's pantheism. Those are all errors. He isn't pantheistic or panentheistic. He is everywhere present. And by the way, he in, inhabits all of eternity equally. Now, for us, we don't know what that means. It means God is equally present in the past. He's equally present in the future. He's equally present right now in this moment. He isn't more here than back there, and he's not less here than he will be there. His, his eternity 
is that he fills everything equally. Now, that's why systematic theology is very difficult because it's hard for our minds to get around some of these truths. So let's just stick with the scripture. He, he is going to stand forever. Now look at verse 10. Behold, the Lord shall come with strong hand. His arm shall rule for him his reward. That's the strong arm. You know, we have an expression in America, someone is strong arming me. That means they're stronger than me and they make me do stuff. It's not talking about that. It's talking about his all powerfulness, which fits with his eternity and knowing everything. Now look at the omniscience. Who has measured the water in the hollow of his hands? So if we want to know how much water is in the ocean, we have to measure it. God's omniscience means God does not count things. You understand that? You know what it says? He already knows the number of everybody's hair on their head. I always wonder about when one falls out, does he have a, you know, he knows that. He also doesn't discover things. God never discovers. He never finds something new. That's what all this means. But have you applied that to your life? God knew John was going to get the flu, if that's what you had. He knew about it before the world was created because he didn't discover it. He didn't hear about it. Do you understand the implic? Have you, are you awake enough to think of the implications of what this means? What these attributes mean? That, that God knows everything equally, completely, since before time. Because he invented time. Now, Isaiah tells us something. Now, you, you want something interesting. Here's the past. Here's the present. And here's the future. Do you know what Isaiah says a little bit later in chapter 40? God, this is the Greek letter theta, stands for God, sees equally the past, the present, the future, and eternity. This is eternity, and this is eternity. Time is just this brief period right here. God his eternity means he's equally present here, 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 and here. He's equally present. That's omnipresence. He is equally, well, I shouldn't say equal. He is differently operating. God is operating one way here, one way here, one way here. It isn't like he, he is not present and engaging, but look at this. The way he operates always follows the grid of his character. So he is unchangeable in the fact that, that who he is never changes, but he interacts with the past and with each of those people and with each of us right now and in the future. So all of that to say that's the character of God. Now keep going. In chapter 40, there are more. Look at his wisdom. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, verse 13? Who does God take counsel with? Who taught him justice? Who gave him knowledge? Nobody. All the nations are just a drop in the bucket. You ever heard that term, a drop in the bucket? Did you know there are about 50 terms in the English language that come right out of the Bible? Kind of like feet of clay. You ever heard of feet of clay? Do you ever, all these little, uh, there's an old English expression, saved by the skin of your teeth. What? I don't even know what skin of your, your teeth don't have skin. Maybe it's your gums. But all these little expressions came into the English language through the translation of the Bible. Look at this. His majesty, that's one of his attributes. All the nations are like nothing. God is unique. He's like, verse 18 says, like no one else. He is the creator. Look at verse 22 says, God sits above the circle of the earth. Here's earth like this. God sits above it right here. He is the creator. Uh, uh, all the inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Look at verse 22. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain. Remember I told you that in creation, Isaiah stresses that God took the universe and it was, uh, he had this grand plan and he went like this. And it unrolled. From where? Well, 
when was what created. On day one, God separated the light from darkness. And day two, you know, remember his spirit moved on the face of the deep and he said, let there be light. And he starts creating the earth. When does he make the stars and, and what, you know, the galaxies and everything else that's out there? Right here. He's here, he's making the earth and light and darkness and the firmament separating from the waters above and the waters below. Then he makes the universe. Is that a mistake? Is that an error? No. That's how you understand it all. If he is standing on day one, two, and three here on earth, well, standing, you know, God is a spirit, but you know what I mean. And then on day four, he comes out for his next day of work and goes and unrolls all the galaxies all the planets, all the stars. Think about what you learned in high school or college about physics, that light travels you know, from this star toward us at 186,000 miles per second. You know? We know that, the speed of light. But that's assuming that the star was created out there and we've waited for four light years or 16 billion light years for it to get to us here on Earth. But actually what, did you see what that says? He sits above the circle of the Earth, verse 22, its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, and he stretched out the heavens like a curtain. He spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He opens, he, he, he pushes them outward. So if actually the Lord went and put that galaxy and put that galaxy, he rolled them out from the earth. You know, it's very within the realm of physics that their light spread out from the earth and that we're, we're seeing all light that at the same instant appeared in the sky because God rolled it out from the center, which is the, actually the record of what it says he did. But I'm not teaching Genesis, so we have to get back to the Creator. See verse 26, lift up your eyes on high, see the Creator who created these things. He brings out their host by number, he calls them all by name. Do you know how many stars there are? Right now they think there are 600 octillion. Octillion. How many zeros is that? The same number of stars as synaptic connections in your brain. Most neuroscientists say that your, if you look at your neurons, and every, every brain cell has these little arms going out, and those arms connect with the arms of other cells, and every one of the times the little arms touch each other, it's called a synaptic connection. And what they say is when a, a good pianist is playing the piano, if you could see the synaptic connections in their brain as their eyes are looking at the music, as their mind is remembering, uh, you know, the, the speed and everything else, as their hands are moving around, it says their brain would look like a synaptic firestorm or lightning. It's just going. <laughs> but there are enough connections in your brain to equal, to rival the number of stars. That's great little trivial fact. God has named every star. And they're not how, you know how astronomers, we have an astronomer, different ones of you like astronomy. What do they call most stars? A106423. What a name. It's kind of like, sounds like a prisoner number. God has named every star in the universe. See how great he is? He's, he is the one, he, he is the God who, who brings out their host by number, verse 26, uh, look at verse 28. Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, verse 28, the creator of the ends of earth, neither faints nor is weary, he's omnipotent. But look at verse 29. He gives power to the weak. He gives us what we don't deserve. That's his grace. And there's grace in the Old Testament. And here's mercy. 
Those who wait on the Lord renew their strength. They will mount up with wings. They'll not be weary. He is merciful, understanding when we lose our strength and lose our way. Okay, real quickly, let's jump into the attributes of God. You don't have to think very deeply about this, but I just want to survey for you systematic theology. God has four kinds of attributes. Here's one, his incommunicable attributes. Theologians divide attributes in two parts, communicable and incommunicable. Incommunicable is what only God can be and do. Communicable is something he offers to us to respond to. God is independent, which means he's self-existent. Remember I told you about how Satan began? Satan, the universe, and you and me are not self-existent. We have to be held up. We have to have someone give us life. Do you understand? The only reason I'm standing here talking to you is God is holding my life and allowing it to continue. If he lets go, whoop, there goes my marker in my life. That's self-existent. God is the only one that doesn't need anything. Doesn't need anything. We do. The sun does. The sun is burning itself up. Uh, millions of tons per second. The sun. Every, every thing in this universe is wearing down. Except God. He's self-existent. He is unchangeable. We call that immutability. He's eternal. Eternity means he sees all time the same. Look at this. He's, he is looking from heaven at Abraham right now. The same as he's looking at you and me. The same as he's looking at the people in the millennium. Now that does not fit in my brain. Because to me, Abraham is a past event. God doesn't have past events. Do you understand that? He calls himself, I am the great I, what? Yeah. Am. He's eternally, constantly existing, but seeing everything. That, that's what this, he's, his eternity, he sees all time the same. Omnipresence means he's present everywhere, but he acts differently in different places. When he was back on Mount Sinai, he was like a burning fire up there talking to Moses. But when he was, you know, at the shore of the Red Sea, he was taking the wheels off of Pharaoh's chariots. He's acting differently. But he's everywhere present. The same God is everywhere the same, but he acts differently. Unity, now that's a big one that we need to learn. Most people think that God has this love and grace are, are huge. And then he's got this other attribute, wrath, holiness. And they think those are kind of his mini problematic, the ones that kind of get us in trouble once. No, all God's attributes are equally important. They're all the same. He, he emphasizes all of them. Now, his communicable attributes are, there are five of those. His spirituality, we're spiritual. I am a spirit that's right now running around inside of this tent, the body. Invisible. Uh, this, this idea that God is invisible, yet he, and there's a part of me that's invisible. My mind, my, you know, that, that, that immortal part of me is invisible. Knowledge. God allows us to have knowledge. But God's knowledge is the highest. He doesn't learn things, discover things, or count things. He is omniscient. Now you say, what's the difference? Well, uh, I took all my systematic theologies and I looked at them, and they named the same attributes different ways. Some theologians call God's omniscience, but that word isn't in the Bible, so this word is in the Bible, knowledge, so they call it his knowledge. So that's why I put both of them up there. He is truthful, he is faithful. Uh, those are his communicable attributes. Now, the next are his moral attributes. You've heard of all these. God's goodness, his love, his mercy, grace, and patience. Those are all interrelated. His holiness, his peace. Peace means orderliness. Oh, want me to stop for a second on that one? The more godlike you are, the more orderly your life is. The more ungodlike you are, the more disorderly your life is. Did you know the less of God there is, the more things go to disorder? And look how our world is. So God is a God of peace or order. To be complete is to be order. Righteousness and justice. We covered his justice and why he's judging the nations. Jealousy. 
Did you know with God, jealousy is positive? For us, jealousy is negative. I wish I had that green jacket or uh, sweatshirt. You know, I wish that I had as much hair as some of you have, you know, because I'm always cold. Do you know how hard it is to be cold? All of your blood is up here and mine is radiating all the heat and I just get cold all the time. So I wish I had, I mean, Bonnie has so much beautiful, lovely hair. I just wish the Lord would give me some. No, that's, that's human jealousy. What's God's jealousy? He seeks to protect his honor. He is jealous for your attention. He is jealous for your loyalty. His wrath, look at this, he intensely hates, look at this. What word is that right there? All. There aren't little sins to God. Be careful about that. We like to think that we're an exception that my sin is not as bad as theirs. God is equally intensely hating all sins. And finally, his attributes of purpose, his will, his freedom, his omnipotence, that's his power and sovereignty. You've heard of the sovereignty of God or the power of God, his perfection, his blessedness, his beauty. I lo- the reason I define some of these for you out of the systematic theology is I love them. The beauty of God is that God has everything desirable There, now you're seeing why David loved him so much. What did David say? There's nothing on earth I desire like I desire you. You have everything I long for. Oh, really, David? What were you doing with Bathsheba and with Uriah? We're not perfect. You understand that? Even though we fail, even though we sin, even though we are tempted and and do not respond correctly, God knows down deep the desire of our heart. And you know what David said? I know I failed, I know I sinned, and he confessed it before the whole world. How do you like that? David's sin and confession are forever settled in heaven. Did you know in heaven the record of what David did is forever written down it'll never go away? Wouldn't that be awful if the worst thing you ever did in your life will never be erased? Not if you know the Lord. And God has everything desirable. He saw that in David's heart. He said, David, even though you broke all ten commandments, even though you did such a terrible sin, and even though it affected your earthly life forever in heaven, when I see you, I would say, that's the man after my own heart. That's God's, God's grace. But David believed God was beautiful. Do you believe God is beautiful? Is he everything you desire? Or do you desire other things more than him? Do you know what the idolatry of this generation is? Our generation right now? It isn't that we love our music and our games and our pictures and all of our social interactions more than God. We just have put them both on the same shelf. They're both equally important. And what we say is, I'm struggling to have time to read the Bible, but as soon as we get a free moment, do we run to our Bible or do we run to our digital device? Which do you go to first? Think about that. And see, that's why David was a man after God's own heart, because he said, there's nothing on earth I desire above you. And then God's glory kavod his heaviness. Okay, so... We have exactly 22 minutes. How do we unleash some of the attributes of God into our daily life? So let's hear hear are all the attributes together. How do we apply these 20 plus attributes, his independence and unchangeableness, eternity, omnipresence, unity, righteousness, justice, beauty, glory. How do we do that? Well, let's narrow it down to the big four, okay? Everybody's heard of these, right? Omnipresence, the God is equally present everywhere in the universe. His omniscience, that he doesn't learn anything, he knows everything completely. His love, now everybody knows that one. God is love. God so loved the world. And then his omni-all-potence, power. So so God, everywhere present, everywhere know, everywhere power, and love. Okay, now let's just talk about life. Our problems. All of us here know what our problems are. And so, I'll just list a few of them. Number one, finances. 
You know, your parents lose their job or you lose your job or, you know, you didn't have enough money and you your account, you got a fee because you're late making a payment. How about a car accident? You borrow someone's car and you crunch it or someone crunches you uh, or worse. You know, you fall, you break. How about unexpected loss? A grandmother dies, a grandfather dies, a parent dies, a brother or sister dies, a partner dies, a best friend dies. Oh, you know, this is the biggest one in America. Cancer. Do you know cancer is moving down in the age? Did you know right now that the most cancer getters, at the highest rise, are the 30 and 30-ish year olds? They're getting cancers that only old people got. And boy, the, the scientific community is really studying this. They say, is something to do with the radiation from your phone? Is it something to do with, with the, the atmosphere? Is it the food, the ultra-processed food? What is it? Cancer, though, colorectal cancer and a lot of other cancers are just skyrocketing in the 30-somethings and the 40-somethings. Okay, so... Those are some challenges. So here, here we are. Let me put the challenges. You lose your job, you get a car wreck, or you get cancer. Now let's put around it the attributes of God. Number one, God is good all the time. All the time. That's one of his attributes. God is wise. Remember this, this omniscience he has. God is all-powerful. I put that as a roof. Uh, there was recently a hailstorm uh, in America with the bad weather, and someone posted a picture of all of them sitting outside on their deck with this roof uh, over them, and the hail kept getting stronger and stronger until it broke through this whatever they had, glass or whatever, uh, plastic roof. You, n your job loss or car wreck or cancer, God could have stopped it. See, that's what all-powerful means. It means if you're here, nothing can get to you without getting by a good God who's so wise and powerful he could stop anything. See? One more attribute there. We always think of our car wreck, it's me, or our cancer, it's me, or our job loss, it's me. Wait a minute. Who's in the box with you? Who's receiving that? See, God is everywhere equally present with each one of us. What did Jesus say in the Great Commission? Lo, I am with you, what? Always, even to the end. So, when you have a car wreck, you're not alone. When you lose your job, you're not walking away from, you know, wh whoever announced it to you alone. Jesus said, I will never leave you, or what? forsake you. So think about the attributes of God. We, as Isaiah 40 says, are held by his arms. When Bonnie and I had each of our children, they always make this, at the hospital, they make this grand thing, you know, the baby's born, they take it away from the mother, clean up the baby because usually they're a little messy. They, they get them all, you know, nice and they wrap them up in this little blanket and they look like a little torpedo tube. They're about this big, you know. Uh, they're just this little bundle and they put it in the mother's arms, and, and it's just wonderful. And then before they take them to the nursery, they let dad hold them for a second. Oh, it's so scary. You don't want to hurt them. You don't want to drop them. Uh, this little torpedo, and I remember I went, and she said, now you, you have to, you know, hold on tight. And so here I am holding little, our little firstborn. We're held by God who is always powerful, he's always with us through everything, he designed us. Everything about you that's unchangeable, that means your eyes, your hair color, your, what family you were born into, what country you were born into, whether you're a man or a woman, everything about you, God designed. He's powerful, omniscient, good. He designed you for a purpose and he's holding us. Now think about this. When we struggle with what we look like, who our family is, 
You know, I was born into a poor family. Our family was so poor. All three of us kids lived in a room no bigger than this. My two sisters and me, our room was not even this big. And we lived in drawers. That's where we slept. And they pushed into the wall and they came out. We were in this. My parents were in a smaller room. Uh, we, we were poor by every measure in America. I didn't pick my family. By the way, they didn't pick me either. <laughs> Did you think about that? You might not have picked your parents, but they didn't pick you unless you're adopted. Now, if you're adopted, you're special. Because they went looking for you and picked you. you know. But if you're just born, not special. They didn't pick you, you didn't pick them. Who picked your family? God. Who picked you? What? Everything. God. So either God is good in how he made us or bad. How are, what, what are you projecting to people when you lament and moan and, and, and have all this? In America, we have so many medicated young people because they're struggling with everything, their identity. And their, um, their, there was a recent... Um, New York article about this girl that got finished with school and finally she said she had to get a job and she interviewed and she said, it's horrible, I don't like it. She said, I have to go there all day long. I can't do it, I can't do it. She didn't like life. The life that God put her into. And God is either good or bad, he's either wise or dumb. He's either all powerful or he was so weak he allowed something into your life, you know, he, was, he didn't notice it. He's either everywhere present all the time or he's absent. Now look at this. Your response and my response to all our struggles in life are the loudest declaration of what you believe about God. Before you tell all your friends all this big stuff of what you believe, they've been watching you. And how you react to life shows more about what you believe about God than anything else. That's why... I've told you this before, when I was a truck driver and I would be backing my truck up and delivering with my little pad and going in the break room, my fellow truck drivers did not like me. But they did know what I believed about God. And so whenever they had a problem, like they got in a car accident or their wife got cancer, they thought of me as a connection to God. Actually, Jesus is a connection to God, but I knew him. And so whenever they had a problem, they would run and talk to me about it because my behavior had declared my, my belief about God. Okay, what does God want from us? Look at Isaiah 40 at the end of it. This is what you already know. You've probably memorized this. Verse 28. Have you not known, have you not heard Isaiah 40, 28? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he neither faints nor is weary. He's always on duty. His understanding is unsearchable. He knows everything. Here's God's plan. He gives power to the weak, to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even the youths will faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Verse 31. But those who wait on the Lord. Remember I told you yesterday there are eight different Hebrew words for wait? This is one of those. Wait hopefully. Wait for the Lord, knowing he's coming. It's kind of like when children are... Their parents say, just wait for me right there in the front step. I'll pick you up. I'm going to get the car. They're waiting and looking. They're expecting. Those who wait, expecting for the Lord to do something, renew their strength. They mount up with wings like eagles. They run and are not weary. They walk and not faint. All of that I just read is trusting the changeless truths about God. Again, to summarize, his eternity, he sees everything at the same time. His unchangeableness, his purposes and promises never fail. His wisdom, God always chooses the best means to get in our lives what he wants. His omniscience, he knows everything. Haha, <laughs> this is interesting. Did you catch what's up there? Jesus once said, he looked out at his people, he said, did you know if what I just said, the people would have heard in Tyre and Sidon, or in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would still, they would have repented if they'd have heard this message. Do you remember reading that in the Gospels? Jesus said, if they would have heard this, they would have repented. Jesus not only knows everything that actually happened and will happen, he even knows what's possible. It's kind of like playing chess with a computer. It knows every move. 
That's what his omniscience is. He knows all things that will actually happen and everything that could have possibly happened. And Jesus refers to that all the way through his ministry. By the way, his desire for connection. Yesterday we were talking about prayer. God invites our personal contact through prayer because the doctrine of God's connection is prayer changes the way God acts. Not changes God. God responds to prayer. See, he has something he wants done. And he says, John, I want you to do it. And John says, I'm too busy to do it. So he says, Stitch, do you want to do it? Stitch says, I want to do it. Did God change? No. He acts in response to our prayer. And if our prayer is, Lord, I want to do your will, he works through us. Okay, real quickly before we go. Lesson one, how do you unleash the truth of his eternity? God sees everything at once, vividly in the past, present, and future. His eternity is defined as God has no beginning, no end, no succession of moments. He's always the same. So how does that affect you and me? Well, we talk to God. Now, I want you to think about prayer like this. Have you ever gone on an airplane? Any of you? You got here on an airplane, most of you, right? What is the pilot of the airplane doing? When he's coming to land in CJU, Jeju Airport, who does he talk to? They're called the air what? Air traffic controllers. Prayer is just like talking to an air traffic controller. God is the air traffic controller. The air traffic controller is looking at a screen. He sees all the planes. He sees the weather. He sees any unidentified flying objects. He knows where the planes are on the ground. He knows everything, the schedule and everything. And you're coming in, and you can't see any of that stuff. You're coming in with your plane, and if you land on the wrong runway, you're going to hit another plane. If you land on the wrong runway, one's going to land the same way as you. If You understand what I mean? It's just you've got to completely trust. The pilot does, the air traffic controller. They're the only one that sees everything. They know what gate is going to be open for you. They know what runway, what side runway. That's what prayer is. And what is Proverbs? Do you remember all the way back last week? What is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 that you memorized and wrote out and everything? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Can you imagine the pilot looking out the window and saying, I think that runway looks pretty good. Forget it. I'm going to go in on my own. One did that two weeks ago. And two, air, two private multi-million dollar corporate jets clipped each other. It said because one pilot thought he knew more than the air traffic controller because he's got his private million dollar plane. And he went down and he clipped another plane. He was not talking to air traffic control. See, if you talk to God and trust God, what does Psalm 1611 say? It says, David is talking, he says, God, you'll show me the path of life. You'll be the air traffic controller. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are endless pleasures. You know what God says? Believe me that I am everywhere present. I know where everything is. And I'm going to pick the best runway for you to land on in life so you don't crash. Now, that's a choice every day. Talk to God. Trust God. Now, I already told you about this. Remember my friend Boaz that delivered the Bibles and had all the, the fingernails burnt by the Romanian police? I, I, I asked, how did he do that? And they said, he believes, Boaz believed, that God put him in Romania for this time and that his life's goal is to get Bibles to Romanians and to Russians. And if God thinks the best way to do it is for him to lose his fingernails and suffer horribly, he trusted God over his fears. Wow. Wow. Number two, unleash the truth of God's unchangeableness. Look at Psalm 119, uh, the longest chapter in the Bible. Psalm 119 with me real quickly. Uh, we have six minutes left. Look at verse 98. This is what the Lord says. Uh, Through your commandments, you make me wiser than my enemies. They're ever with me. Verse 99, I have more understanding than all my teachers. Your testimonies are my meditation. Who wrote Psalm 119? Probably Ezra. Ezra that we've talked about. What did Ezra say? Because God is unchangeable, trustworthy, 
He's everywhere present. He knows everything and loves us. He's, he's all powerful. God has given us the best advice possible already. His word is a reflection of his unchanging nature. We don't need to wait for the newest book or an updated system or tech. Did you know people go to the bookstore waiting for a new book to come out or online for a new website to post something, and God says, I've already given you the best advice possible. It's right here in my word. All I want you to do is trust me. I'm unchangeable. I'm trustworthy. Now, Hebrews 5. I love this. If you want to go there, I'll read it to you. But this is one of those verses you should have underlined in your Bible. How do you, how do you grow in this life of trusting God? The writer of Hebrews put it this way. For at this time, you ought to be teachers, verse 12, Hebrews 5, 12. You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. You are needing milk like a baby, not solid food. What's a baby? Everyone who only partakes of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. He's a baby. How do you grow up? Verse 14. Solid food belongs to those who are of full age that by reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. What does God say you need to do? You need to trust God enough to obey his unchanging advice. You need to just act on what you already know is true. You need to obey God right now. Most of us know more about God than we're doing. Thirdly, we need to unleash the truth of his wisdom. We need to learn to see God's perspective on your life events. Do you remember what Joseph said? Joseph's brothers are cowering in front of him. They're afraid. They, they've been exposed as the ones who, who put him into the pit and sold him as a slave. And now he's the vizar, the prime minister of Egypt. And they, they started saying, uh, you know, all these things that dad said you should forgive us. You know, they were just trying to pull something out of the air. And look, look what it says in Genesis 50. This, this is the wisdom of God coming right out of the mouth of his servant, Joseph, let me get to 50 and verse 15. Um, Joseph wept, in verse 17, wept. And then verse 18, his brothers went around and said, Behold, we're your servants. And Joseph said to them, 19, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil, verse 20. But God meant it for good. Unleash the truth of God's wisdom. He loves us so much, you can trust him. He knows everything going on. He's so powerful that he is going to shape your life's events. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Trust God's way is perfect. That's what David said in Psalm 18. Real quickly, unleash the truth number four of his omniscience. God wants us to trust that he knows everything. And what he wants us to do is trust him enough to be sanctified. What is sanctification? Being as obedient to God as possible. Starting every day saying, Lord, checking in. I want to do your way. I want to walk your way. I want to obey you. I want to be useful to you. And I'm really struggling. Remember what Paul said? He said that, he kept asking the Lord to stop having, he didn't want so many problems, his thorn in the flesh. And God says, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. So what do we do? God wants us to pray. Prayer changes the way God acts. The choices we make in life matter. He's going to give us rewards. Prayer is vital. Apart from him, we can do nothing. And so what we do is we prayerfully bring all of our struggles to the Lord and say, God, you're here. I trust your word. You love me so much. You already know every detail of the past, the present, and the future. And I'm going to trust your character. I'm going to put, I'm going to put my hand in yours and let you put your arms around me. And as soon as we start doing that, we have a life of perfect peace because we know nothing can get to us that the Lord doesn't let in. Nothing gets into our box. This is me. That doesn't get through the omniscient, omnipresent, uh, all-powerful God who loves me. And I just 
rest in that. See you soon.